The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled It Takes a Team for HCC, Improving Outcomes Through Multidisciplinary Collaboration and Modern Therapeutics. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash QYD860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Um, I want to thank everyone for, for attending our program today. Um, today, as you can see, we'll be talking about It Takes a Team for HEC, Improving Outcomes Through Multidisciplinary Collaboration and Modern Therapeutics. I have the pleasure of um, being joined. I guess my name is Amit Singhal. I'm a hepatologist from UT Southwestern. Um, and I have the pleasure of being joined by three of the um, experts in the field. Um, two uh, medical oncologists, um, Dr. Anthony al from USC, uh, Dr. Ahmed Kassab from MD Anderson, and then one of my fellow hepatologists, Dr. Anjana Pillai from U Chicago. So with that, we'll get started. Um, you know, I think that I was asked to, to start us off with giving some background about HCC from an epidemiologic and a larger treatment landscape perspective, and then you'll hear some excellent presentations about the um, evolving role of systemic therapy in, in these different stages. So to start, um, I think it's important to think through where HCC lands when we think of cancer-related death in the United States. And this is the annual report uh, to the nation on the status of cancer that literally just came out um, uh, just uh, in this past month. And you can see here that we are doing a great job in terms of mortality for most cancers. Um, and there's unfortunately a few cancers which has increasing mortality both in males and females. And you can see that liver cancer is currently the third in terms of males and um, second in terms of females. So it is increasing in terms of mortality for both males and females. When we think of this, so we've made a lot of progress, as many of you know, over the last several years. Here you can see the evolving BCLC staging system and treatment allocation system. And this has gone through a major facelift um, in 2022. As many of you know, this used to be a siloed treatment allocation system where there were curative treatments for early stage disease, um, uh, local regional sort of embolic therapies for intermediate stage disease, and systemic therapy um, was reserved for those patients with advanced stage disease. And I think as you'll hear through the talk, one of the exciting things is that we've started to see a breakdown in terms of those silos, where you can see that these patients are now being considered for even um, uh, surgical therapies if they present with smaller um, uh, intermediate stage disease, and some of those patients with larger intermediate stage disease may be better treated with systemic therapies. And so we're really seeing a breakdown in terms of these silos, and we're seeing also some exciting trials in terms of combination therapies. Um, those are sort of the, the changes that have um, uh, come about in terms of the BCLC staging system. Some of the things that have been preserved are the fact that this uh, staging system really still continues to reside on the assessment of three main factors, not only tumor burden, but as you'll hear throughout the talk, liver function, um, not only from a child pew um, perspective, but also the presence of portal hypertension remains one of the key things that we must assess. And as hepatologists play a critical role as we communicate with our medical oncologists to make sure that the patient is receiving the appropriate treatment throughout the entire um, course. Now, it's been an exciting time um, for systemic therapy in HCC. I think many of you who have been in the field for a while um, recognize all of the explosion of systemic therapies that we've seen come about. Um, you know, SHARP was presented in 2007, um, published, I think, in 2008. Um, and really, we thought that this was going to be sort of an explosion of therapies shortly after that. But instead, we had a decade of no other therapies coming to market. And you can see over the last five years, we've seen numerous agents come to market, both in the first line and second line setting. The initial therapies that came to market were largely other tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, and more recently, once again, as you'll hear, we've seen the um, introduction of immune checkpoint inhibitors um, in terms of uh, improving survival even further, um, you know, particularly in the first line setting. And these um, advances in the systemic therapy space have now been um, introduced into the BCLC treatment uh, allocation system. And you can see here that when you take a look at the BCLC staging system, you can see that the preferred therapies um, really are atezobev, dervatremi, if not feasible, serafinib, lenvatinib, continuing to play a role in the first line setting, 
And we also have several second line therapies that are also available. And then we even have cabozantinib, which has data in the third line setting. So really a tremendous advance from where we were um, in 2007 and 2008. So despite all of this progress in terms of systemic therapy um, evolution, as well as our evolution in terms of understanding patient eligibility, there's clearly more work that needs to be done. We know that most HEC cases are detected beyond an early stage, and this is in part because of the underuse of HEC surveillance. This is a topic, as some of you know, near and dear to my heart. Um, and I think that, you know, despite the advances that we've seen in the systemic therapy landscape, we know that the biggest sort of difference in survival continues to be between early stage detection and later stage detection. So we've seen advances in terms of prognosis in the intermediate and advanced stage setting now getting up to two to three years, as you'll hear. But if you find people at an early stage and you can deliver curative therapies, this is really where you see median survivals, you know, 10 years plus. And so we really need to continue improving HEC surveillance so we can find more and more patients at an early stage. And we know that HEC surveillance is only one step in a larger continuum. And so the other thing that we know is that curative th therapies, including resection and transplantation, are unfortunately underused even in those patients that are found at an early stage. And so we need to make sure that those patients are then referred on to receive appropriate treatment, guideline concordant treatment, and so early stage detection can then translate into curative therapy receipt and improved overall survival. So when we take a look at some of the data that actually um, uh, continues to persist in terms of the treatment for patients um, at, in the advanced and intermediate stage setting, we see that um, older TKIs remain widely used in advanced HCC. So here you can see one analysis from the Cardinal Health Oncology Provider Extended Network. Um, and you see that most patients in this analysis continue to, leave, uh, continue to receive TKI therapy um, you know, with serafinib accounting for 54%. Um, you'll see some posters here where we're starting to see some evolution of this, where we're starting to see more uptake of immune checkpoint inhibitors. But I still think there's room for improvement in terms of um, introduction of these novel therapies in our patients that are found at an advanced stage. And we also know that not only is it appropriate treatment choice, but many patients unfortunately un um, go untreated. And so here you can see another um, analysis from uh, several U.S. community clinics where they had 586 patients with advanced stage HCC. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's um, a minority, uh, sorry, 44% uh, sorry, received no active first-line therapy so there's still a lot of underuse of therapy even in, in these patients. And then of those patients who did receive first-line therapy, there's underuse of second-line therapy. So we need to make sure that we're introducing these advances in terms of clinical practice. Um, and finally, we also see underuse even in the intermediate stage setting. So clearly, you know, like we made a lot of progress, but even more work to be done. And once again, this is a slide that you'll see later on in the talk, um, but I, I think it goes without saying that um, multidisciplinary care is really one of the, the key concepts um, that, that we want to impress upon you today. You can see that by the, the composition of the, the panel here, where this isn't just a hepatology disease, this isn't just a medical oncology disease, this really requires multiple disciplines to come together and talk um, and work together to improve outcomes for these patients. And this is in part related to different therapies being available at different stages, once again, liver function playing a critical role in terms of the appropriate treatment across different stages. And so you can see here all of the people that would need to be sitting in a multidisciplinary team. And this isn't just a feel-good concept. There have been several studies that show that this improves clinical outcomes, including guideline concordant treatment, curative therapy, and improving overall survival. And you can see some of those listed in the table on the right. And so many of us, including the AASLD guidelines, which will come out um, in the next several months, really you know, endorse this as being standard of care for our HCC patients. And so us as hepatologists need to make sure, once again, we have a seat at that table and are working with our interventional radiology, our medical oncology colleagues to make sure that patients are getting the appropriate care throughout the continuum. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague and friend, um, Dr. Al Kurari, who will be talking about um, selection of treatments for patients with advanced HCC. Thank you very much, Amit. Welcome, everybody. Uh, this has become an exciting topic because we do have a lot to talk about now, as was alluded to. And this is in contrast to literally only five or six years ago 
where we only spoke about a couple of TKIs as, as treatment options. So I'll be speaking about the treatment options both in first and second line and how we think about them and incorporate them into the treatment. So one of the combinations that recently got approved by the FDA is the combination of an anti-PDL1 and anti-CTLA4 antibody, so dervalumab and tremolumumab. And this is based on sound biologic rationale, right? So CTLA4 primes the T cells in the periphery, mostly in the lymph nodes. It expands a specific subset of CD4 positive, ICOS positive T cells. And then the anti-PD1 therapy acts on the CD8 positive T cells in the tumor microenvironment. But those cells have to be there for it to be active. So targeting CTLA4 and PD1 have complementary and and yet independent uh, biologic activity. So the story started with immunotherapy with single agent nivolumab. That was the first study, Checkmate 040, to look at immunotherapy with an anti-PD-1 antibody in HCC. And the fear at that point, was it feasible? Was it safe? And what we learned from Checkmate 040 is that we could give immunotherapy to HCC patients, that the safety profile was similar to other tumor types, and we had a 15 to 20% response rate, and those responses were durable. So the next step after that phase one, two study was to take it to the phase three setting with Checkmate 459, which compared nivolumab to sorafenib. And this was a study that was designed for superiority and unfortunately, it was statistically negative. It did not show the superiority of nivolumab as a single agent to sorafenib. And then based on the emerging biologic rationales of combining PD-1 with other agents, such as CTLA-4, such as anti-VEGF agents, uh, th the field shifted towards combination therapies. So the first combination therapy to come into the, into the market is, is uh, the combination of atezolizumab bevacizumab based on the Embrave 150 study. This was a study that took patients who had no prior therapy for HCC, had good performance status, preserved liver function with CHALP-UA, and all patients must have had an endoscopy within six months of initiating therapy. And they were randomized to atezobev versus sorafenib. Primary endpoint was, uh, it had actually co-primary endpoints of PFS and OS. And as you can see here, this was a very positive trial with both the OS and PFS endpoints being met. The median overall survival with the combination is 19 months versus 13 months with sorafenib. And you can see here uh, at 18 months, the OS rate was 52% with atezobev versus 40% with sorafenib. PFS went to 6.9 months versus 4.3 months with sorafenib. Now, as far as response rate, this was also unheard of before this study, that by RESYST 1.1, there was an overall objective response rate of 30%, uh, with a CR rate, a complete response rate of 8% with the combination. The safety and tolerability of this regimen was as expected, there were no surprises uh, with the combination as far as safety and tolerability. This is, again, the response rate that I alluded to. And here you can see in this volcano plot that the, uh, the safety favored the combination uh, with less diarrhea, less hand-foot-skin reaction, less anorexia with atezobev, and the things that were more frequent were expected from bevacizumab, such as hypertension, proinuria, et cetera. It is not shown on this slide in details, but there was a concern about bleeding with bevacizumab. The all-grade events with bevacizumab were about 25%, and with uh, sorafenib about 18% um, or so. So if you look at all grade, it was slightly more common with the atezobev combination. But when you look at grade three and four bleeding events, they were actually quite similar, 6.4 versus 5.8%. And again, this probably has been mitigated by this requirement for endoscopy within six months and treatment of varices per institutional standard. 
That's how the protocol was written. <coughs> now this is looking at quality of life and you see that the median time to deterioration for multiple measurements was improved for atezobav compared to sorafenib. So patient felt better for longer and this was actually statistically significant in this trial. So the therapy works, it has a manageable safety profile and improves quality of life. Now switching gears to the other combination that is now approved in first line is the combination of dervalumab and tremilumumab. By the way, I didn't say it, but I think it's obvious to everyone, bevacizumab is an antibody to VEGF, to vascular endothelial growth factor, and here tremilumumab is an anti-CTLA-4 antibody. Similar eligibility criteria for a first-line study with one nuance. This study excluded patients with main portal vein invasion. So the poorer risk patients were excluded from this trial. You see the randomization you see that there are two arms of dervalumab and tremilumumab. One that, is, that doesn't have the X over it is what we call the stride regimen, which consists of one loading or priming dose of tremilumumab at a higher dose with continuation of dervalumab as a single agent. The other one gives four doses of both derva and tremi, but the tremi is at a lower dose. That arm was closed earlier based on emerging data and then the other arms were dervalumab and sorafenib. As a reminder, as you see further data here, the statistical power was to compare dervatremi versus sorafenib and dervalumab versus sorafenib. This trial was not powered to compare dervatremi to dervalumab alone. The primary endpoint was overall survival. And here you see, again, another positive trial with improvement in median overall survival from 13.8 months with sorafenib to 16.4 months with the combination, meeting its primary endpoint. Hazard ratio of 0.78, a p-value that's statistically significant. And this trial had actually one of the longest follow-ups, so you see this kind of long tail uh, because it had longer follow-up, and you still see the separation of the curves all the way to 36 months, with the, with the OS rate at 36 months being above 30% for the derva tremi combination, which had never been seen with advanced HCC before this. Now, at this meeting, the, you will see a poster on Monday uh, that looks at outcomes in Himalaya in this trial based on liver function. Uh, and this is based on liver function within the CHALPU A category, of course, because this was a, an eligibility criteria. Now let's look at the safety, because this is an IO-IO combination and theoretically could have more immune-mediated complications. But I do believe that this single priming dose of TREMI did help to make the frequency of immune-mediated events less than we would normally expect with CTLA-4 combinations. So as such, if you look at the patients that received high-dose steroids to manage immune-mediated events, that rate was 20% with the T300 plus D with the combination and 9.5% with DERVA alone. So yes, it is double, but it's manageable. And most of it was hepatic events followed by diarrhea, colitis, followed by dermatitis. So for oncologists and those of you who do treat HCC and use immunotherapy, these are things that we are used to managing and that are definitely manageable with, with steroids. Um, of note, just to contrast, and I'm going to come back to that data set, when we looked at Nevo plus Ipi with a high dose of ipilimumab given four doses, the frequency of patients requiring high dose steroids was much higher in the 50% range. So again, the concept of a loading dose was beneficial here in this approach. Uh, these, this is looking at other uh, adverse events in general. You see that the rate of grade three and four events is low in general and no surprises from what you would expect with an IO-IO combination. So I showed you data from two IO-based combinations, atezolizumab, bevacizumab, and dervalumab, tremelumumab. Is there still a role now for single-agent immunotherapy in advanced HCC? 
I alluded to this trial, Checkmate 459, which compared nivolumab to sorafenib in first-line advanced HCC. This was a trial, again, designed to show superiority. Numerically, there was a difference with a median OS of 16.4 months versus 14.7 months with sorafenib, but the trial did not reach statistical significance. There was a high rate of crossover from the sorafenib arm to IO in subsequent lines, uh, certainly, but the response rate in this trial was 15%, confirming the signal that we had seen in the phase one, two studies of both nivolumab and pembrolizumab. But that data now is not alone anymore. So let's see what else we know. Before I go on to other data sets, the tolerability of single agent PD-1 is, is exceptional in advanced HCC in my opinion. And this is looking at the FACT-HAP quality of life questionnaire, which is a disease specific questionnaire that looks at multiple measures that are shown, uh, the categories of which are shown on the right in that circle. And this had a high completion rate of over 70% all the way through week 113 on study. And you see for the entire duration of the study participation, uh, the, the quality of life favored nivolumab compared to sorafenib. Now here's another data set. Remember in Himalaya, there was a, an arm with dervalumab alone that was designed to be compared to sorafenib. And you see that the median overall survival with dervalumab alone was 16.56 months. And the median overall survival with sorafenib was 13 months. The hazard ratio for this comparison, 0 0.86, with the upper limit of the confidence interval being 1.03. So that's certainly within the non-inferiority range. So we can conclude from Himalaya that dervalumab was non-inferior to sorafenib. And you can also see that the median OS with dervalumab is certainly within the same range that we saw with nivolumab, and the response rate is similar to what we saw with nivolumab. So consistent data with single agent PD-1 or PD-L1. And lastly, the Rationale 301 study, which looked at another anti-PD-1 antibody, tislilizumab monotherapy, also that was non-inferior to sorafenib in first line. So three large data sets showing consistent uh, outcomes. So who should this be used in? Uh, so l let's look at a first patient with advanced HCC and how do we think about these therapy options. If there are no contraindication to immune checkpoint inhibitors, the patient have preserved liver function, good performance status, we have two regimens that are reasonable within first line. The combination of atezobev or dervatremi, um, and these are based on level one evidence. If the patient has contraindications to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, they would go to a TKI, such as lenvatinib or sorafenib. And if they have no contraindications to immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy, but are not ideal candidates for combination, you're worried about the TKI toxicity, I think single agent PD-1 or PD-L1 has adequate data to offer an alternative therapeutic approach as well. So what about other newer combinations and, and the emerging data there? I'm going to go through these a bit faster because these are not approved and they're, they're not used in the clinical setting currently. But LEAP002 compared the combination of Pembro and Linvatinib to Linvatinib plus placebo, similar eligibility. Again, this also excluded main portal vein invasion. Uh, primary endpoints were OS and PFS. And even though there was a numerical difference with Pembrolenva with a median OS of 21 months versus 19 months with Pembro and placebo, this did not reach statistical significance. Uh, the PFS favored uh, Len Pembro. Uh, I'm sorry, the P PFS actually was also quite similar between the two arms. The response rate uh, was higher with uh, Len Pembro at 26% versus 17% with Lenvatinib alone. So what did we learn from this trial? that it really will not change standard of care since it's a statistically negative study, uh, but it also reinforced the activity of lenvatinib as a TKI in first line uh, with you know, confirming the data from Reflect that it's an active agent. Now, the median OS with lenvatinib here is longer at 19 months, and that probably has to do with improved management of these patients, multiple lines of therapy, and, and multiple other factors. The side effect profile, no surprises. Uh, 
but you certainly can see if you look at the line that talks about discontinuation of any treatment due to adverse events, that was 18% in the combination arm versus 10% with LEN plus placebo. Uh, so definitely you have to interrupt therapy more when you use the TKI-IO combination. Cosmic 312 is another combination trial looking at cabozatinib with atezolizumab versus sorafenib. Cabozatinib is a unique TKI that it not only targets the VEGF receptor pathway, but it also targets Axel and MER and MET. So it has immunomodulatory effects and uh, had a great rationale to be combined with IO. And you see here, this trial had two primary endpoints, PFS and OS. And it was designed to be positive if either endpoint is met. The PFS was positive, 6.8 versus 4.2 months. But the interim OS looked similar between the combination arm and sorafenib. And then we heard later in a press release that the longer follow-up still did not show a difference in overall survival and that this regimen would not be submitted for uh, regulatory approval. Then the other combination that was most recently presented at ESMO is camrolizumab with rivoceranib. Camrolizumab is an anti-PD-1 antibody. Rivoceranib was previously known as apatinib, which is a TKI against VEGF receptor 2. Similar eligibility criteria to other phase uh, first-line trials. And this trial was positive, actually showing an improvement in median OS, 22 months versus 15 months and actually better PFS, which we don't show. The challenge with this study, one of the challenges is you see the overall grade three and four events were up to 80% with a high rate of heterotoxicity. As you can see, 33% grade three and higher when you look at heterotoxicity compared to sorafenib. So that, that's a bit concerning, but manageable. And the other aspect of this study, because you may ask why wouldn't this change the standard of care? This study was largely accrued in China, 70 to 80% in China, and was 75% hepatitis B. So its applicability broadly um, may, not, may warrant further, further investigation. This is a trial that's looking at the combination of nevo-ipi versus sorafenib or linvatinib, and this has not read out yet, so we look forward to these results. So what happens after progression in first line? We talked a lot about these improvement in first line outcomes, but patients now are able to get second and third line treatment. We have several data sets in second line and beyond. The celestial data set is comparing cabozatinib to placebo, but all of these data sets are post sorafenib, right? None of them are post atezobev or post dervatremi. But cabozatinib showed improvement in OS compared to placebo, 10 months versus 8 months. And the unique thing about cabozatinib, again, is that it allowed second or third line, and about 25% of the patients had actually were in third line treatment. Resource compared ragorafenib to placebo, another positive study. And REACH was limited to patients with AFP of 400 or higher, comparing ramesurumab to placebo, also positive. So these are all agents that could be used in second line or beyond, but we currently extrapolate and use them after these I.O. combinations without data. So how to sequence them is not really fully established. Another combination that was studied post sorafenib is Nevo plus Ipi. And you see that there were different doses and schedules that were looked at, but arm A is the one that received the accelerated approval with Nevo 1 milligram per kilogram, IP 3 milligrams per kilogram every three weeks for four doses, followed by Nevo maintenance. The response rate was 32% there, and the median OS in second line and beyond was a striking 23 months with this combination. Uh, and based on that, it received accelerated approval. Does this work post-IO combinations? We do not know at this point. There are some single-center single, age, single uh, center re uh, reports about this. So some take-home uh, messages for selection of second-line therapy. So if patients receive IO combination in first line, you could use a TKI in second line, any TKI. I do not know how to really separate between them. Neither does anyone else. So we look, hopefully, uh, forward to data for on sequencing or maybe some real-world evidence to guide us. Ramesurumab is a, is a reasonable choice in AFP above 400. nevo is in parentheses because you may not want to use it post dervatremi That's a similar mechanism, but post-atezobev potentially, but there is very limited data. Uh, 
And if you use a TKI, we do the usual sequencing, which you are, you are used to seeing. So this, you've seen this PCLC algorithm, so I won't go through it as has been alluded to, but certainly the field has changed and we have many more options for our patients. Thanks, Anthony. So, so um, at this time, what we'd like to do is uh, do a, a first multidisciplinary tumor board where we'll go through a case, and I think we'll go through some lessons of how we apply um, all of the exciting data that we heard um, to, to a specific patient. So the patient that we're going to start with is a 60-year-old patient with compensated NASH cirrhosis who initially started with a 4.7-centimeter LR5 lesion on surveillance imaging, liver function, child PUA with preserved bilion albumin INR, as you can see there, but does have some portal hypertension with a platelet count of 72,000 um, and, and an AFP of, that's elevated at 42 nanograms per milliliter. So this patient is discussed in a multidisciplinary tumor conference, and I think as many of us would do for this patient um, you know, with early stage disease, um, was referred um, for chemoembolization and referred for liver transplant evaluation. Um, once again, highlighting that if these patients are found at an early stage, we need to be thinking about curative therapies. Um, the initial post-treatment imaging shows stable disease. Um, so, you know, at this point, the patient did not have um, a robust response, and, um, you know, the thought was perhaps there's another feeding vessel, and so underwent repeat chemoembolization. Repeat imaging, once again, shows stable disease in that lesion that was treated, so no um, uh, large response, but also now has progression. So two new LR5 lesions. Um, you may recall the initial one was just over five centimeters and the two new ones are 3.2 and 1.9. The good thing is that the child pew um, uh, status is preserved, so it remains a child pew A, but we have seen some degradation in liver function. So the LB grade now going from one to two. Good performance status. And in parallel with the increased tumor burden, we've seen an increase in AFP from 42 to 97. So, um, you know, let's, let's talk about what we would do um, for this patient. So I'm going to start with you, Anjana. Would you um, continue LRT at this point, um, or would you think about transitioning to systemic therapy? Um, what would you at your center? Yeah, so I, uh, I think this is not an infrequent case that we see. And to your point, you know, um, the liver function declining always gives me a little pause about further LRT. And really would depend where the other two lesions are, um, if they are, if we can treat them with another modality like tear and still preserve liver function. And overall, the trans patient still remains a good transplant candidate functionally. Um, that's an option, but otherwise, um, I don't think it's wrong to consider systemic therapy here. Anthony Ahmed, how would you guys treat this patient at your center? Um, so I agree with Angina, except I'd, I would lean a bit more towards systemic therapy because we know I'll be great two versus one is actually quite prognostic yeah. and the survival of these patients really gets impacted. So I'd like to expose this patient to this effective systemic therapies, which may still lead to downstaging and transplant as well, which is a new thing. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, Ahmed, what do you think? I agree with Anthony. This is, uh, by definition, progression uh, and resistance to local therapy. You have multifocal disease. This is not one lesion where you can get away with trying another form ablation, for example. So when we see multifocal progression after local therapy, this is by definition. And as uh, Angela said, you know, the LB score migration. So there is a couple of reasons here to move to systemic therapy. Yeah, I think that, you know, in general, this is tough because this patient was going down the curative route. Um, and so I think, um, you know, this is a tough discussion to have. But I do think that the LB grade degradation from one to two is a major issue here. And I think this is an important concept because when we think of liver function in an HEC field, we're used to thinking of child pew. And when we think of this, this patient is still a child pew A. And if you don't think about these sort of subtle degradations in liver function, you can miss it until it's too late. Um, and if you don't take a look at it now, this patient would be a child pew B, and then it may be more difficult to use these effective therapies. Now, you know, you already heard from Anthony that the response rates with these new therapies are much higher than we used to see. And as you'll hear during the, the subsequent talks, we do see downstaging with systemic therapies. Um, and so this would be someone who I think would meet the definition of taste failure, would have progression, and should be considered for systemic therapy. Now, one can also argue if this patient had a good response to the initially treated lesion, i.e. you take that five centimeter lesion that's now you know, completely responded, 
and you have two new lesions, once again, a slightly different story perhaps than somebody who has stable disease in that initial lesion and then develops two new. So these things are also sort of subtle and nuanced um, and best dis um, discussed in a multidisciplinary format. But I think most of us would agree at this point, given both progression of tumor burden as well as degradation of liver function, this patient would be considered for systemic therapy. <laughs> So I think we've somewhat talked about this. If this patient stayed in LB grade one, I think more, we would feel more comfortable perhaps trying local regional therapy again, um, you know, being more aggressive with LRT to maintain this. But I think once again, continue to watch this closely. And I think it also depends on how selective you can be. I think Anjana, this is what you were getting to in terms of location, et cetera. Can you do a selective taste or tear or is this more non-selective in nature? So, you know, once again, this patient meets the definition for taste failure, um, can be considered for systemic therapy, um, and, you know, undergoes uh, an EGD, and so we'll get to, like, what the EGD shows, but what systemic therapy would you recommend? So this is a patient with child QA, LB grade 2. So we have two options here, uh, atezobev or dervatremi, and I'm going to tell you why I would choose atezobev here. Uh, this is a patient that still is in the BCLCB, uh, stage, we are hoping for downstaging, and the response rate with atezobev, even though it's side-by-side -side comparison, is higher. Uh, so that would be my preferred regimen here. He has an EGD, he hasn't had recent bleeding or arterial events, so that would be my preferred regimen. I'm at any different? No, I totally agree. So what if he had large varices or red whale? So you know, this is a tough question, and we're going to need a lot more hepatology help here. But the way Embrave 150 was done, if, if the patient had varices and they were treated per institutional standard, that patient would have still gotten on the study with atezobev. So is this an absolute contraindication? Probably not. So I would rely on a conversation here with my co colleague to say, what do you think the risk of re-bleed here? is, and if it's high, then I may go more towards Dervatremi. The reason being is, I don't need to say this to hepatologists, but I don't want this patient to decompensate and, while on therapy and, and curtail further treatment. Yeah, so Andre, what kind of discussion do you have with, you know, the, with your medical oncologist when you have this patient with large varices, red whale signs? Like, what, what's your yeah. discussions? I mean, it's, it's a difference if they had, you know, st recent stigmata, like you said. If they have red whale signs, you have to really ban those, right? Um, so that may change my decision. You know, it's, we don't have a lot of data here, and that's one of the discussions that we have is we can ban through, and if we have pretty good success. You don't have to wait months. You can wait, you know, two to four weeks and start uh, Tesobev. Um, if, if your repeat EGD shows um, things look a little better, but then you also have the risk of band ulcers and bleeds from that, so you really have to be proactive about PPIs and things of that nature. And I think it's just a risk-benefit discussion you have at that point versus using, you know, um, Dervatremi. So two follow-up questions. Are there any patients you don't get an EGD in? That you're like, oh, this patient looks so good. I'm just going to skip the EGD, and I'm just going to go right to systemic therapy. You know, I don't. And if you're kind of alluding to Baveno here, you know, with platelets greater than 150 or um, um, a transient uh, elastography stiffness less than 20, that hasn't really been validated in patients with HCC. If you have big tumors, you can't really rely on that criteria. Um, so I do get an EGD on all our patients for that reason. Anecdotally, I mean, sorry to... No, no, go ahead. I've been surprised, actually, how many patients who look good with child QA have varices since we started doing this. And, and this is important, right? We know that patients with child QA disease, I mean, and you saw this even in the trial, that many patients with child QA disease, once again, the audience is well aware of this, can have large varices. And this really does highlight that right now there's no validated non-invasive criteria for the evaluation of varices in patients with HCC. So the Beveno guidelines do not apply for patients with HCC. You can have, you know, basically inaccurate transient elastography measurements, et cetera, and you can also have um, sort, of, um, sort of falsely elevated platelet counts, whether high or low, related to the tumor. And so this is the type of thing where right now the recommendation is to, for all of these patients to undergo EGD. Now we've had a couple questions that have come through in terms of, 
what is the what where is the threshold? What is the cutoff? Is it large varices? Is it varices with red whale signs? Is it only if they bled? And this is tough because there's no widely accepted threshold. And this in part comes to the way that this was sort of presented in the New England Journal paper. It basically said treated per institutional recommendations. Um, and you take a look at sort of all the supplements and everything and I have, and there's no data. There's no data that was collected in terms of the initial paper. Go ahead. I would add one thing though. Yeah. There was this sub-analysis done and presented by Richard Finn at AACR that yeah. the higher risk or the higher grade yes. bleeding events were limited mostly to patients with main portal vein thrombosis. But what we don't know is which patients were excluded from the trial, right? So that's, sure, that's sure, the sure. patients who got in. Yes. So that means that if you treat them according to your institutional standard and you got in, and that's an important analysis, that's an important subgroup analysis, that those patients with main portal vein invasion were the patients who actually, largely the ones who subsequently had a bleeding event on trial. So uh, at least the way that we do it at our center is if they have red whales or if they had a recent bleed, once again, we lean towards more alternative therapies, whether that's Dervotremi, Serafinibran, et cetera. If they have large varices and main portal vein invasion, so if you use the two together, once again, that may be a high-risk subgroup where you consider alternative therapies. If you have large varices and you do not have main portal vein invasion, then I think that you can treat accordingly and then put that patient on a Tezobev. This is all anecdotal. It's all being made up in real time as we go through this. Um, once again, the ASLD guidelines will once again have this anecdotal expert recommendation for this is how we should currently be doing this. But I think we're going to see more and more data come out for this specific thing because once again, as hepatologists, this is where your medical oncologist is going to call you and say, should I or should I not treat with a Tezobev? And so this is what we have to be aware of because we have to guide them appropriately. And so it's not just what you see on the um, upper endoscopy. It's really taking a look at all of these other factors. Yeah, and, and you know, quickly to uh, add to the complexity of this and highlight the importance of the multidisciplinary management, as Amit was saying about the um, institutional guidelines, uh, you really have to know your patients. So if you have somebody with um, high tumor load, they have main portal vein, thrombosis, they, uh, they, they already are an anticoagulation for bland thrombus, or their platelets are 35,000. So all of these factors can really play a role in what we used to call prophylactic banding. So prophylactic banding nowadays in this patient population is not the old uh, um, prophylactic banding uh, statement. It is really needed in some patients. So our algorithm would necessitate to do that if you have all of these factors together. Main portal vein thrombosis, if the patient has low platelet count or an anticoagulation for any reason, because even if there is no red well signs, these patients are at very high risk for bleeding. Um, and, I, can I, and I would just add to that, um, if we see median varices, I wouldn't just document that you saw median varices, I would start a beta blocker. You know, you, you want to try to do something preventive to make um, the risk of re-bleeding less. Yeah, no, I think that this is also very important because that, like, those upper endoscopies may or may not all be done by us. They may be done by a, a GI colleague. And so as that hepatologist who's involved in that multidisciplinary management, it's important to make sure that loop is closed. If the GI didn't start the beta blocker, that this is actually started. Um, and then the final thing that I would say is that this isn't just esophageal varices. Right? This is also gastric varices. This is portal hypertensive gastropathy. And that's why like, when we take a look at this, it's really a matter of risk of bleeding. And that's more of a comprehensive management than just the presence of varices, how large, red whales, et cetera. And my understanding is that the, the bleeds that really we're seeing are largely gastric varices. Those are the ones that are tougher because the esophageal varices we can treat. We can treat with banding, et cetera. Gastric varices, yes, we can treat. You can do glue. You can be beta block, but like much less effective. And so this is once again where we're, we're seeing worse events if, if large gastric varices. So now for this patient that we're going through, meets the definition for taste failure, should be considered for systemic therapy. And I, you know, as you heard, the, the, really that dichotomous pathway comes into what does the upper endoscopy show? Is this patient low or higher risk of bleeding? And you know, I always say beauty is in the eye of the beholder, so the beauty or the ugliness on that upper endoscopy is really a comprehensive assessment. And then it's our job as hepatologists to communicate with our medical oncologist. And if that patient is deemed to be low risk of bleeding, then I think many of us would start a Tezobev in that patient. Um, and if we see that that patient's higher risk of bleeding, then we can consider alternative first-line therapies, Dervotremi having that preferred status, Serafinib and Len, 
being um, viable options as, a, um, as an alternative, particularly if you have contraindications to immune checkpoint inhibitor. Um, and you know, you'll see a, a, a poster that's being presented um, at, ASL, at, at this meeting on Monday, um, also taking a look at real world treatment patterns of atezolbev in terms of how does this look in clinical practice. So um, this patient initiates atezolbev, tolerates it well, maintains good energy, has no AEs, stable disease on imaging, but at month six has um, uh, progression. So fortunately remains child A. Once again, um, you know, the nice thing about systemic therapy is these patients generally have preserved liver function on systemic therapy, but the AFP unfortunately at this point um, increases um, in parallel with this radiologic progression. Um, and so what would you recommend for second line therapy uh, after atezolbev? Anthony, you, you briefly talked about this in your presentation, but what would you, what do you do in your practice in terms of traditional second-line therapy after atezolbev? Yes, I f frequently choose a TKI, and if anybody forces me to tell them how scientifically I make <laughs> that decision, I will fail. So, however, in this case, I think among the TKIs that we have available, I may choose lin linvatinib, and, and that may not make sense to some folks because the reflex study excluded patients with main portal vein invasion. But the reason I would choose it is because that agent has shown probably consistently the highest response rate as a TKI and a robust survival outcomes. A patient is still child QA, so I want to give them the benefit of potentially uh, benefiting from this, the chance to benefit from this. Now, uh, would using cabozantinib be wrong? Would using ramucirumab be wrong? Absolutely not. Um, so eat a TKI would be, but I think if I was in clinic, I probably would have chosen linvatinib here. Okay. And then, um, you know, it's not part of this tumor board discussion, but let's say this patient then failed that second line TKI. So let's say you put them on linvatinib. They, you know, were on this for another three, six months and then had progression again. What's your preferred third line therapy for those patients who make it to third line? Yeah. Uh, frequently that would be cabozantinib. Uh, one, that's an agent that has second and third line data. It's actually one of the few agents that in the initial study had patients who received therapy other than sorafenib before being exposed to it. So it probably would be cabozantinib. Okay. So your preferred sort of sequence here would be atezolbev, len, and then cabal. Yeah. Ahmed, anything different? Um, to add to Anthony, so I totally agree with what he said, and especially for our young um, clinicians here, the way we were talking about, you know, the pattern of progression and local therapy, there is also pattern of progression on systemic therapy. So, for example, this patient developed major portal vein uh, uh, tumor thrombus, the alpha viral protein um, more than t 10 times higher. This is so different from another patient who had only one new lesion that is one centimeter in diameter, and they're doing great on atezobev. In these patients, we just do local therapy, short-term follow-up. A lot of them can just manage uh, with this hiccup, AFP doubled or some, but if you see something like this, it's an indication to to totally change the systemic therapy strategy. Also, it's an indication for us to consider combining local and systemic. So um, our, at our institution, a patient like this would be switched um, to another treatment, like Anthony said, and then we'll also look into considering the uh, radiation to the portal vein thrombosis, for example. So this is when you really should be more proactive. This is child PUA, ECOG zero. So you really have to be more aggressive. Yeah, so Ahmed, it's like you knew my next slide coming up. So um, does multimodal therapy have a role in advanced HCC? Um, and these are really emerging directions. Um, none of these are sort of standard of care, but really where is the field going? And you know, to Ahmed's point here, this is an interesting randomized trial that was recently published coming out of China, multi-center study that takes a look at the combination of linvatinib to taste in the advanced stage setting. So this was patients who were randomized um, to receive um, len in both arms, and then you know, one of the groups received um, uh, sort of taste as needed, so like on-demand taste. And what you can see here, um, as you can see clearly by the curves, those patients who received on-demand taste did better. So they had better PFS as well as overall survival in the group that received multimodal therapies. Now, interesting study, randomized trial, very high level data, but this is done in a um, Chinese patient population, largely hepatitis B, you know, the best liver function you can have. And I think devil's in the details of what do they mean by on-demand taste, who received this, what was the intrahepatic, extrahepatic tumor burden. And I think to Ahmed's point, like it would depend if they were doing on-demand taste, if they had local disease progression, and then we're able to keep people on LEND for longer periods of time. So like, I think devil's in the details, and I think 
Um, you know, we would need really data from the Western world, but it is an interesting study to see highlighting really that these siloed treatment options are no longer the way we move forward, and we may see more and more combination therapies throughout the entire continuum of disease. Another interesting, um, very novel sort of therapy that we see coming around in terms of um, trials is um, tumor treating fields. So this um, uses alternating electric fields that can disrupt charged particles during mitosis, and it leads to cell death. Um, so this works in dividing cancer cells, but may actually be very good because it spares quiescent cells. And we have a short video, which we'll queue up now. In metaphase of cell division, cells are a rounded shape as the mitotic spindle forms. Intracellular components such as macromolecules and organelles are naturally charged. Tumor treating fields, or TT fields, disrupt cancer cell division by physically interacting with molecules required for mitosis. When alternating electric fields are applied to cancer cells, they disrupt microtubule polymerization. Tubulin dimers align with the electric field and are not able to form microtubules. This prevents the organized assembly of the mitotic spindle required for normal cell division. The inhibition of microtubule formation leads to metaphase arrest and cancer cell death. In addition, these deformed microtubules can lead to abnormal DNA segregation between daughter cells, which also results in cancer cell death. TT fields can also affect cells after metaphase. If a cancer cell has passed metaphase and enters the cytokinesis phase, the cell takes on an hourglass shape. This state under TT fields creates a non-uniform electric field inside the cell creating dielectrophoresis. Net forces push the macromolecules and organelles toward the mitotic furrow, and this disruption leads to structural disorganization and cancer cell death. Transducer arrays can be placed on the scalp, chest, or torso to deliver TT fields that kill cancer cells. The placement of transducer arrays is personalized for each patient. So a very different type of therapy, but I think one that's interesting, particularly if it can do this selectively. And one of the, the things about the tumor treating fields are that they're frequency tuned, so they really are um, specific to that um, type of cancer. So you can see here that depending on the type of cancer you have, um, uh, you would select a certain frequency, and then it would spare the surrounding normal tissues because the frequency of the TT fields would be different. And so once again, may be very well tolerated um, in terms of therapy. There was a phase two HEPA-NOVA trial that looked at this um, in combination with serafinib and once again had some promising results, um, as you can see here. Um, and now this is um, entering into a new trial where they're planning a phase three study with um, Atezo and Bev. And so, you know, I think we present this as sort of something that's coming around. Um, and I think we're going to start seeing more um, excitement about this as we move forward. So with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to, to Anjana and Ahmed to, to talk about how systemic therapies uh, may, may be introduced into earlier stages of disease. Thank you. Um, so before we go into systemic therapies, just an update on guidelines for treatment of HCC. Um, we all know that early um, stage HCC or T2 lesions or intermediate T3 that can be successfully downstaged with no vascular invasion, uh, these patients should be a candidate for transplant if uh, they cannot be uh, resected. Um, What's important, again, as we had already discussed, is maintain, watching their liver synthetic function, and we know that local regional therapy is best and really only advised if their child's pew A um, and B, and once they get to child's pew C, really with poor, uh, performance status, uh, local regional therapy really is not recommended. And although our ASLD guidelines are going to be updated, as um, Amit, Amit said very shortly, ASLD really doesn't recommend one LRT treatment over the other. Um, so the most amount of data, as we all know, is uh, with TACE. Um, there is more data coming out with TEAR, and you know TEAR now has also been incorporated into the BCLC B guidelines. But that's just uh, important for us to kind of start there. And then um, just a little bit about TACE. We know that 
you know, we think about how we should approach taste. Um, this was a study that looked at a model of uh, 6 and 12, so a large study of over 1,600 patients, all child's pew A to B7, um, no vascular invasion, and they looked at what was the predictor of taste failure. And so really what they noted was a linear predictor with largest tumor diameter plus tumor number being um, the most important thing. So again, if you had a total number less than or equal to six, your median overall survival was much higher at 49% versus if it was greater than 12, was much less so at 15.8%. You can see the nice graphics on the right depicting that. So again, you know, the next uh, stage step really is what do we do with um, disease that's beyond BCLCA and really how far can we push it as far as downstaging to transplant. Um, and we, know, we all know Milan criteria well, but there's criteria for downstaging that's accepted by UNOS for UCSF. And then there are other models including Toronto criteria that's shown here. So with that, I'm going to um, ask Ahmed, can you just kind of talk about systemic therapy versus taste in this intermediate field of HCC. Thank you, Angela. And uh, first off, I, I have to say it was enormously satisfying uh, for, for us as medical oncologists in the last uh, few years, as Anthony said, to see this major transformation, uh, the role of systemic therapy in advanced disease from being palliative, from this disease being a death sentence to being curative. In some cases, we've seen 8 to 10 percent in some systemic therapy studies that go into complete remission. We've seen a uh, larger proportion of patients who go into durable remission as well. So uh, my job is to look into the role in earlier stages, early and intermediate stage HCC. In these cases, as uh, Angina said, you know, these patients are candidates for either resection, transplant, or local therapy alone. So the guidelines doesn't incorporate any systemic therapy. So I'm going to make the case for that based on some literature review, talk about the challenges and opportunities there. So there is no better slide to showcase this than this slide here, which is what's better than head-to-head -head comparison, right? So linvatinib versus T. So this was a, a small study that showed the proof of concept, and there is an ongoing phase three studies now that are exactly following this strategy. So systemic versus local. And there are some other studies that are looking into systemic plus local therapy versus systemic alone or systemic plus local versus local alone. So these um, questions are going to be answered in the near future and we might be able to break the charts like systemic therapy did for advanced HCC as well. So this is the first you know, case here to look into systemic versus local therapy. How about historically speaking here, and this was done in the era of uh, sorafenib in the 10 years between 20, 2007 to 2017. So the concept has been tested, but in a different fashion. So it was, the question was being asked at that point is, after local therapy, can we do adjuvant treatment? Can we do systemic therapy to improve the outcome? Right, but nowadays the question is different. The question is the sequencing itself, would it make a difference? Can we compare them head to head? So all of these studies didn't pan out, didn't show us major survival advantage. Some of them showed some improvement in progression-free survival, like uh, taste plus serafinib versus taste alone here. How about in the era of immunotherapy? We talked about the major advances we have witnessed in uh, advanced stage disease with immunotherapy. Um, uh, how about integrating immunotherapy in uh, early stage disease with local light therapy? Is there a rationale for this? There is a very strong rationale for it. And I have to say, especially for our young investigators as well, the two pathognomonic features for HCC are the obvious one, the um, angiogenesis-driven tumor and the vascularity and imaging, and that's how we diagnose it even without a biopsy sometimes. But the other pathognomonic feature is the immune-rich environment. So we do have very rich uh, microenvironment with immune cells. The liver is immune tolerant because of the portal circulation and all of that, so all of them are turned off. So we have a lot of immune cell infiltration, but they are all inactive. So that's why it is enormously uh, important to address this and it was effective and has been validated to introduce immunotherapy uh, to HCC based on this rationale and it worked. So the rationale here to combine it with the local therapy is also along the same line. 
of localized therapy inducing this local tissue injury that can then induce systemic immune response. So you do the localized therapy and then you see more increase flow cytometry and you know whatever way you look at it, you see systemic response and increased infiltration of the immune cells into the micro environment here. And this was a proof of concept study that looked into ablation plus immunotherapy, immunotherapy here being trimilimumab, anti-CTLA-4, and it proved this concept. They did a very um, um, sophisticated study looking at biopsies before and on treatment to prove that. And based on this, the field has quickly uh, moved to this space here, and you see here a list of studies here that are looking into combining systemic therapy plus local therapy in the form of TACE or Y90 here, and you see immunotherapy plus immunotherapy versus immunotherapy plus targeted therapy, um, and all of these are going to pan out very soon and could transform the way we evalu evaluate and treat those patients with early stage disease. Another study here looking at a tezobev uh, plus taste in a different manner. So it's called demand, and as the name implies, it's either you uh, do a tezobev and taste versus a tezobev and then taste on demand, right? So here the question is, can we look at a tezobev uh, versus the combination and then allow patients um, on demand to have taste, and that's a different concept altogether, different hypothesis as well. So we're going to start seeing more and more of these innovative approaches, either systemic to local, which is, you know, straightforward, or combining systemic and local and both arms in a different way, in an adjuvant manner, uh, after the localized therapy, or to start with the local therapy, induce tissue damage, induce the systemic response, immune response, and then following that with immunotherapy. And this is another study looking at taste in combination with uh, Derva and Bev in patients with uh, localized disease. So taste versus taste plus Derva alone versus the three uh, combo. And I'm going to turn it um, on to Angela again. So um, we talked a little bit about potentially, you know, um, uh, immunotherapy and early disease, but just to kind of review hepatic resection, so curative options currently, resection, ablation, transplantation. Um, it's important, as we all know, the vast majority of uh, HCC occurs in the background of cirrhosis. So when we are looking at guideline recommendations, you know, best if it's a single nodule, and then it really depends on whether or not the patient has clinically significant portal hypertension, which is defined as a hepatic pe uh, venous pressure gradient greater than 10. Um, but also, if you're not going to get a uh, hepatic venous pressure gradient on everyone, which we, we usually don't in the U.S., as opposed to other countries, um, you know, if you have a platelets of less than 100,000, or you have splenomegaly, or you have a bilirubin greater than one, you know that they have portal hypertension. So the first thing you have to figure out is do they have portal hypertension, yes or no? And then second is how extensive is your hepatectomy? Uh, will it be? So if it's minor, so considered less than three segments, you look at the MELT score, if the MELT score is low, very, you know, even intermediate, they do very well. But and, it, and if you have major hepatectomy, as long as they really don't have portal hypertension, you do you don't do as great. But the risk of liver decompensation is under thirty percent. Now it's very different when you have por patient with portal hypertension. Even a minor uh, segmentectomy can lead to up to a thirty percent risk of decompensation. Of course, if you have portal hypertension and a major segmentectomy, then you really are, you should not do it, and you should hopefully be thinking of liver transplant. And so that's where the future liver remnant is really important. So how much of the, of, of the native liver is remaining? And in a cirrhotic patient, when you look at the normal liver um, versus in someone that has cirrhosis, you need a higher future uh, liver remnant of at least 40% or more. Now, the problem with this, even though we call resection curative, um, it may be curative for that lesion, but you know that the recurrence rate, unfortunately, is up to 70% at five years, and currently there's really no proven adjuvant therapy. So this is a study that looked at that specifically, uh, looked at the recurrence uh, and looked at number of nodules, size of tumor, tumor-free margin, and blood loss. And as we can, um, you know, extrapolate, 
smaller tumors, uh, tumors that have higher uh, margins and uh, less blood loss um, are tend to be more favorable. And the only uh, study that looked at this specifically, the STORM trial, which is phase three, actually did not show, um, did not meet any of their endpoints as far as looking at improved overall survival with adjuvant therapy. So that's where we are right now, but as Ahmed said, I think the future is quite bright with the newer therapies that are coming out. So I'll let you take it away with that. All right, <laughs> so it's more intriguing question now. We're you know, starting to get even more bold. How about surgical cases, right? So patients going straight to surgery um, over years, last few decades, none of these studies, new adjuvant or adjuvant uh, in the era of chemotherapy showed any survival benefit. So again, going back to the basics, I um, uh, talked about the two pathognomonic features of HCC, angiogenesis-driven tumor, and the immune uh, modulation, the environment that is rich in immune cells. So the same thing here could put a very strong rationale uh, for this patient population, patients who are undergoing resection, as, as Angela said, you know, 70% of them would recur uh, after about three years here. There is a strong rationale to look into anti-angiogenesis and also the immune modulators here. Currently, there are very key landmark studies. We're waiting on some of them very soon to be um, mature and to be announced. So the uh, DERVA plus or minus BEV versus placebo, that's Emerald 2, Checkmate uh, 9DX Nevo pl versus placebo, and this study we should hear about soon, Atezobev uh, versus uh, active surveillance, and this is all in the adjuvant setting after surgery, and then keynote Pimpro versus placebo. So some of us would, might ask, you know, so what is the value to doing immunotherapy after resection here? And if you go back again to the basics, surgery is an insult to the liver, and there are actually a lot of studies in the surgical literature showing exactly that, that the surgery surgical scar, the surgical incision, uh, the uh, low immune system around surgery can give rise to increase of the Im immune inhibitory cells, specifically T regulatory cells. Also, it increases the CD8 cytotoxic cells. So you see this surge. So surgery acts like those ablative strategies we talked about, the episcopal effect and all of that. So the same exact thing. So think about it like the episcopal effect with local therapy. The same thing happens with surgery. So that's, you know, a strong, strong rationale to doing the adjuvant immunotherapy after surgery. And we did a, a study that looked into perioperative. So we did new adjuvant for six weeks, NEVO versus NEVO epi, and followed that by adjuvant after surgery. But to our surprise, we weren't looking for pathologic response here. We were looking into recurrence rate and so on. The first case on this study with NEVO epi um, achieved major, actually achieved um, um, uh, pathologic complete response, so 100% necrosis of the tumor. And then we finished this study, 30% of the patients were found to have um, achieved this pathologic complete response. And this was a major event in immunotherapy era. So based on this, you know, me and Anthony took it to the SWAG, you know, me, uh, team, and we're working with them towards something uh, similar in the new adjuvant space. And you see here, this is the first case uh, that showed the uh, major necrosis on imaging. This is also translated under the microscope, and you see the correlatives here, the common suspects, the granzyme, uh, A and B, the PDL1 staining, CD3, CD8. So you see here very strong rationale to do this, and the pathologic response was an endpoint, and we're going to start seeing this more and more as well for those new adjuvant studies to look into the major pathologic response, and those patients actually who achieved this response never recurred. So those 30% never recurred, the other patients, 50% of them recurred after two years. Similarly, at uh, Hopkins, they did a, a Cabo plus Nevo study, and most of the patients were high risk for resection. They were still localized, but they had high risk features, either the tumor size, if, even if it's a single tumor, or multifocal disease. So those patients underwent Cabo Nevo, and then 12 out of 15 were able to undergo margin negative resection, and uh, four of them had more than 90% necrosis, and one had pathologic complete response. <coughs> and then, a TESO plus BEV, and this is um, uh, done uh, at our institution as well. Uh, it's a single institution study looking at new adjuvant at TESO BEV for three cycles, followed by surgery, again looking at the endpoint of major pathologic response and if this will be translated into lower recurrence rate. And then back to Anjana again. 
So this kind of brings us to current day where, you know, historically when all this, when we learned about immunotherapy, the early data on immunotherapy um, for uh, pre-transplant was actually quite discouraging. So one of the first uh, case reports was published in American Journal of Transplantation, just one of our high impact journals, and it was someone who had um, HCV related HCC got immunotherapy and seven days post-transplant died of graft loss. So, and then there was multiple case reports that kind of showed similar findings until about two years ago, um, the Mount Sinai group um, actually showed that they were able to treat about 10 patients with single agent NEVO without a washout period, and none of those patients actually had uh, um, a graft loss, and only one had mild rejection that was treated. So that's kind of the impetus for this, which is look, this trial, which is looking at HCC patients listed for liver transplant, child's pew um, A to early B, um, getting Derva plus Tremi, um, and then you know you have to wait for a washout period of roughly two and a half months. And so the primary endpoint is again looking at cellular rejection, and then uh, secondary endpoints are graft loss. So we have evolved quite a bit even in the last two years, and there's also some data again, mostly case reports of looking at um, immunotherapy as salvage in the post-transplant setting, and kind of the largest of those series shows about a 30% um, graft loss. So again, that's not great by any means, but if there's no other options and it's truly salvage, and with um, patient consent and understanding risks, that's another you know, area that's being explored. So again, I think just to kind of recap Ahmed's initial side, uh, slide, this is why it's so important for this concept of multidisciplinary team. I think many of us have tumor boards in our own institution that's either run by hepatology, oncology, or um, interventional radiology, but it is important to have all those key pieces there at your tumor board to um, optimize treatment options for your patients. And as Amit alluded to earlier, each of these trials have shown improvement in overall survival or curative treatment, um, as well as um, decrease in time to treatment. So really working together is very important for our patients. So with that, we're gonna do our last tumor board. Um, so we have a 50-year-old man who has hepatitis C cirrhosis. Um, as many of our patients now, he has SVR, so cured from his hepatitis C, lost to follow-up, not undergoing surveillance. COVID happened, now um, he's presenting with a 7.5 centimeter lesion. So it's one tumor, no vascular invasion or distant metastasis. It's a child's PUA patient, excellent platelet count, albumin right there. Um, and then underwent resection. And so unfortunately, even though everything kind of pointed to a single lesion that was very favorable, he was found to have extensive microvascular invasion and moderate to poor differentiation. So at this point, um, you know, what I'm at, so I mean, this is something that we see not infrequently. Um, what do you usually do for these patients? Yeah, so I mean, you know, we've already talked about all the exciting data that's going on in terms of clinical trials, um, both in the neoadjuvant as well as the adjuvant space. So like if you have access to a trial, I think this would be a great patient for a clinical trial in terms of adjuvant therapy. We know that um, microvascular invasion and um, poor differentiation are very strong predictors of recurrence, but we don't have anything that's proven in terms of adjuvant therapy, despite sort of like, you know, a lot of excitement for this. So this is a patient that I think would be important for, um, you know, to have a counseling visit to say that, you know, we, even though he underwent resection, that we are concerned that there would be a high risk of recurrence and that we would be aggressive in terms of doing post-resection surveillance. And so we typically do um, quarterly surveillance, um, you know, for at least a year um, and then Can move on to semi-annual. on that? What, what do you do with surveillance? Meaning, what are you getting? Yeah, so we do an, um, we do an MRI of the abdomen and a CT of the chest. So I think that's also important to do full staging for these patients. Um, Anthony and Ahmed, would you agree? Do you do anything different? 
as far totally as... Totally agree. And, and, you know, it's a good point that, you know, Amit said about the clinical trials. I've seen some people who just, you know, presume that patients should, you know, um, get something. But, you know, and me and Anthony can attest to this. We've treated enough patients to see this massive autoimmune phenomena from one single dose of immunotherapy. So we really shouldn't do it unless it's in a clinical trial setting to protect our patients. So, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> so, I, you know, let's say that um, we had one of these um, uh, adjuvant therapies appropriate. Um, so I'll go back to our oncologist. So would you, you know, let's say, and you obviously wouldn't know the path. Do you have any kind of data? I'll ask you, Anthony, first as to what you would use. So this is a solitary tumor. It's quite large. Um, as your guideline for when you would do adjuvant therapy? Um, so the adjuvant therapy trials have had different criteria, but the, ma the majority of them have focused on high-risk patients. So based on size and the presence of microvascular invasion and poor differentiation, this patient has several high-risk criteria. So certainly would meet criteria for the trials. Um, Outside of the trial, I, unfortunately, again, we would just observe this patient. Uh, there is a question about role of LRT. I mean, despite some different things being tried in Asia, mm -hmm. I, I don't think has, anything has panned out consistently uh, t to do something like this. And it's frequently a contentious discussion with our surgeons who really want us to do something. Yeah. yeah. And would you um, guys in your institution, Ahmed, uh, um, do LRT prior to resection of this patient? Yeah, that, that's a good point. And, you know, you could see this happening in a lot of tumor boards. You know, if this patient is kind of borderline, right, seven and a half, but if you have a, a 16, 17 centimeter tumor, everybody's worried, AFP is 10,000. So in these cases, most of the tumor board discussions would lead to doing some local therapy upfront or even systemic sometimes, who, you know, done this with, you know, to try to downsize, improve the biology, and show the surgeon that this patient, the AFP is going down now, not up. You know, this patient is not showing metastasis. You can do it. 90, for example, to so local therapy plus or minus systemic in this category is very, very well documented. Maybe not for this very specific patient with this size, but it is in general very, very uh, valid consideration and it again highlights the importance of the multidisciplinary tumor board. Yeah, I, I think I agree. So, like, um, you know, I think that obviously every case is individualized, and so, like, I think multidisciplinary discussions are always important for the nuances of any one case. I think when we think about neoadjuvant taste in general, we have to remember that there was a study that was done for neoadjuvant taste prior to resection, and all that was seen in that trial is that patients didn't make it re to resection. So they had progression of disease, and so in general, when you take a look at it as, as a whole cohort effect, neoadjuvant taste is not a good idea. Now, I think Anthony's point of like adjuvant taste, I think from the Asia's data, it's interesting. I think the idea here is you're treating you know, micro satellites that may be around that resection bed. But once again, I think that, you know, patients in Asia have a distinct advantage to the patients that we see here because they often have very well compensated liver disease, if not the absence of cirrhosis. And so they can get away with being more aggressive with doing these kind of chemoembolizations after a resection and having preserved liver function. The concern here, if you did this routinely, once again, using LRT after resection, is the only major thing that you would accomplish is liver dysfunction, not actual clinical benefit. And so that's why if you resect, it's really frustrating, and I understand this, but it's to watch closely until we have data showing the benefit of adjuvant therapy. Yep, and I think that's key. You know, I think these patients right now, they're BCLCA, you resect them if you can. Okay, second, this is our last case. So we have a 62-year-old person with a history of NASH cirrhosis. So this time they have multifocal HCC, four lesions, the largest is 5.2. There is no vascular invasion, no distant metastases. Um, there's three lesions in the right lobe. There's one lesion in the left lobe. Um, they're out of Milan, clearly, um, and um, out of UCSF too. So child's pew A, Billy is slightly up at 1.5, albumin slightly low at 3.2, uh, INR is 1.2, platelet counts 97. So Ahmed, how would you manage this patient? 
So it's a very um, common case scenario, right? So you have low volume disease, yet still in the liver, there is no vascular invasion, there is no metastasis. So, so this is a, a very, very uh, a practical case for discussion. So at our institution, the make or break is, can we do local therapy safely in one session? If this is the, you know, the answer, depending on the location, the size of the tumors and so on, we tend to do this, so we give them only one strike. So to borrow the baseball, you know, we never go for three strikes for, for these cases, for baseball analogy here. So, so in general, we always try to go for systemic therapy for multifocal bilobar disease disease. That's the uh, role of some for oncologists. Uh, however, if you have low volume disease, like this patient here could have ablation in the left, maybe taste or Y92 to the right, so we can do that. But we'll have very low threshold to switch our gear and strategy to systemic. Anthony? So, I mean, I understand this is what happens in reality and it happens everywhere. I think the level one evidence is for systemic therapy. And we have seen from subgroup analysis with systemic therapy that these patients with VCLCB have outstanding survival. We're talking beyond two years uh, sometimes, uh, which probably we cannot achieve with any data with liver-directed therapy. Yeah, I, and, I, I, sorry, so, uh, go ahead. Can I, I completely agree with Anthony here. So, like, I think that when you take a look at this patient, and I, I can't calculate the LB grade, I think this patient would be, you know, like, uh, probably an LB grade 2. And so, like, this is the type of thing where this patient has sort of, even though they're child PUA, they have a more borderline sort of child PUA status. And this patient has is beyond UNOS downstaging. And so we've seen that when you take a look at the data for chemoembolization, radioembolization, the best data really are those patients who fall within UNOS downstaging. So more limited intermediate stage disease. And these patients who have multifocal disease, four lesions, largest 5.2, this patient's likely to have liver dysfunction, unlikely to make it onto systemic therapy. And so when you think of prolonged life, I think that this is really, once again, the better treatment is probably upfront systemic therapy. Once again, high responses. If that patient has a response, you may add in LRT with the hopes of downstaging. But I think upfront, systemic therapy would be a better choice um, in this patient. So would the AFP, let's say we had an AFP there and it was like 300 versus 20,000, would that make any difference or you would do systemic? It's regardless? just prognostic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, I think that it's the type of thing where even if the AFP was normal, I don't think you would. I didn't ask for it to be normal. <laughs> <laughs> I asked for something you can trend. <laughs> And to add to the complexity of this case, which is, you know, uh, in the medical oncology community, we're thinking that way going into future studies. You look at this patient category here is NASH cirrhosis. So there is also some evidence recently that those patients are resistant to immunotherapy. So if I am going to start here with immunotherapy, there, we, we don't have any level uh, A evidence yet to do this in clinic, but these are the patients that you do short-term follow-up. So this is not the patient that I would, you know, send to get three months of treatment. I usually get a couple of months follow-up just to be on the safe side. So we're still not there yet where we can guide our therapy decisions of immunotherapy based on risk factor, but in terms of clinical trial setup, this is where the future is heading, that we're going to have those categories, if not equally stratified on both arms, to just focus on each category in a clinical trial setting and start looking into the biomarker profile, which was shown thus far, you know, in terms of clinical trial subset analyses and even in preclinical setting. Great. Well, thank you. And now we'll open up for Q&A. Yeah, I think we've received a lot of um, good questions that have come through. Um, and so I've tried to answer a few of them, just given the fact that we won't be able to get to all of them. So I, I responded via the iPad to some. But, um, you know, one of the, there's a couple that I would like to talk about as a group here. Um, so I'm going to start with you, Anja, on this one. So, you know, we talked about all these exciting um, systemic therapies, but radioembolization, I mean, we talked about this, you know, in the setting of, like, radiation segmentectomy, et cetera. But are you using um, radioembolization in patients with portal vein invasion? Are you using this in selected patients with advanced stage HEC? If so, how are you using this, particularly as we've had advances? And like not to two negative trials of radioembolization versus systemic therapy. So, I mean, not to go into detail of those trials, but, you know, we've had multiple discussions that maybe those trials aren't super reflective of, you know, current practice. And there was, um, uh, I, so we won't go into the trials. But, um, yes, we are, and we're using it not for 
patients with main portal vein invasion, but um, select uh, branch portal vein invasion. And we've seen success with that, as I know other people have. And um, we can even have, we have also downstaged those people to transplant. You just have to wait longer. You know, um, the multi-center study that showed that, that an international study showed a 60% five-year survival. Um, it was a small group of patients, but um, I, I probably like 30-something patients, but with patients with um, portal vein invasion, you could downstage, so that's where I use tear. Yeah, and then um, if you use radioembolization in those patients, are you also using systemic therapy immediately after, or are you just seeing the response to tear monotherapy? We do, so um, before at Tesobev, we were just doing tear. Um, now we wait a couple weeks and um, we'll start systemic chemo. So I think this is an evolving field. Like you know, once again, radioembolization has a lot of exciting. We do see this, and the issue is that we see responses in patients with VP1, VP2, VP2 disease if they have the liver function to tolerate this. Um, and you know, to Anjana's point, you can consider liver transplantation in some of these cases, particularly if you have a living donor liver transplant program. And that's where we tend to once again be aggressive. Um, with some of these patients. I think the other interesting thing, and I'd love to hear what you guys think about this, are these patients who go on a Tazobev or Dervatremi or Len, Serafinib, et cetera, who do have responses, would you consider transplant in these patients with systemic disease, with main portal vein invasion, with metastatic disease who then have an amazing response, do you list them for transplant? And I'll tell you a story of like one patient that we're going through. But what do you guys do? Do you guys consider these patients for transplant? And if so, what, when? It's certainly becoming tempting. Uh, I think the test of time is important. But what is the ideal time, right? Do they have to be in a sustained response within criteria for six months, for a year? Uh, something we have to sort out. I do think that the future will entail transplanting some of these patients. I think like some of the nuances though, as Anthony's and Alun's that you have to think about is how long do you wait, six months to a year? I think most people definitely would agree less than six months is too early. But then how are you gonna get them that living donor? Or I mean, how are you gonna get them an organ? You know, because they will not get downstage criteria. They don't meet downstage criteria. You can send to the National Liver Review Board um, and most of the time they're gonna be declined. So you really do need a living donor, otherwise you're waiting quite a bit of time, and then how are you gonna time your washout period, right? So I think those are really important things to consider when you're doing these extended patients. And, and our algorithm is very clear, you know, so one year wait time, alpha protein normal, negative PET scan. So unless you have very, very strict criteria, you can really have a lot of patients slipping under the radar screen and then becomes much more aggressive scenario after transplant. The one other thing I'd say is natural melt. Yeah, right? If absolutely. they have a natural melt absolutely. that goes up high enough, they can. Yeah. So we have a patient who um, presented with uh, intrahepatic disease, metastatic lymph node, went on a Tezobev, was on a Tezobev for a year, um, actually had complete resolution of the lymph node. The lymph node shrank, it was enhancing, no longer enhancing, we biopsied it, negative, twice. Intrahepatic disease gone. Patient decompensated, has ascites, and now has a bilia four, and has been off a tezobev for a year. And now we've listed that patient. He's been, so he's had this test of time. But these are the interesting cases. I mean, with advances, we have new dilemma that come up. These patients will be presenting to your site. And I think as hepatologists, once again, we have to be cognizant that the old contraindications are no longer contraindications. And so you're gonna have to be thoughtful about referring some of these patients for consideration and working with your medical oncologist to make sure that you stay in the loop. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, you know, if, if, you're, if that patient's just being followed by, quote unquote, just being followed by a medical oncologist, the medoc's like, this is amazing news. You have a complete response and then you don't consider sort of transplant down the road, which can actually help that patient. So one last thing, though, we know from the XXL trial that if you have a response and you're randomized at that point to transplant versus not, extrapolation, XXL, they did better with transplant than just continued therapy. And so one would consider that the same thing may be true for patients with these, this disease. Go ahead. The only thing I was going to add, and I think both of you all said, is that you have to have a protocol. You know, I think it's really, really important that you have a protocol. You discuss that with the patient. This is our institutional protocol. This is the data behind it yeah. before you, you know, because we still... Like you said, you can see sure progression of disease, but in these other patients that we may consider transplant, you can still have graft loss. You know, it's not without um, 
any um, any risks. Yeah, exactly. I was just gonna your comment about oncologists also thinking differently here because in other solid tumors, when you have a CR that's durable with immunotherapy, most of these patients are cured. You don't do anything anymore. So we have to remind ourselves as oncologists that there's another disease, which is the cirrhosis that would still require the... And that risk of recurrence is yeah. higher than if you have a right. complete response with melanoma. Last question, which I do think is important. We talked about all of the amazing responses, PFS, OS, with these new agents. Clearly, it's sort of, you know, there are potential AEs. So can you briefly just discuss the AEs that particularly us as hepatologists need to consider and briefly the management of these AEs that you see with IOs? I mean, I, I think certainly in day-to-day -day practice, it's slightly different than what you see in the trials. Like dermatitis, rashes are very common, right? Jump on them early, topical steroids. If you have to intensify to systemic, fine. Colitis is a real thing, and colitis untreated can be serious, especially in the setting of CTLA-4 inhibition. So that's an important fact, uh, side effect to treat as well. Usually we start with steroids and add infliximab if, if that steroids are not working. Um, the atezobav, I mean, the combination there, it's mostly managing hypertension, paying attention to the proteinuria, so n nothing too striking. And uh, I don't think we need to teach you about hepatotoxicity. Anything you want to add, I think? No, I think it goes back to, you know, know your patients. So those patients have multiple issues. Some of them are in lactulose already, and you could have some diarrhea. They have perineoplastic syndrome. 10% of HCC patients could have diarrhea at the presenting symptom and all of that. So you have to evaluate the baseline. This is not the patient that you walk in and just write something, and you have to know all of their baseline because these things on treatment can make the difference between major as, you know, they, these are life-threatening complications, you know, autoimmune colitis and hepatitis. We've seen some, we lost some patients for that. So you really have to know your patient, get a consult, hepatology and GI, so that way you can get a, an assessment baseline of all um, uh, factors before you initiate your systemic. Perfect. So with that, I know we're at time. I want to take the time to thank all of you for, for li coming here, listening to us. Obviously, thank um, my friends and colleagues here for, for joining on the panel. Um, I think it was a great sort of uh, discussion of all these cases um, and presentation of the material. This activity is certified by Medical Learning Institute, Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Remember to download the slides and practice aids. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash QYD860. This activity is supported by independent medical educational grants from AstraZeneca, Exelixis Incorporated, Genentech, a member of the Roche Group, and Novocure Incorporated.